Here we are at part B-1 of the August 2022 Chemistry Regents exam. Part B-1 consists of 20 questions, a little bit more now on skills, less with just straight definitions and facts, but you're going to see that they're weaved in a little bit. Make sure you have a pen and a piece of paper if you need it, the reference tables, and let's get started. All right, so 31, you're looking at what's called the bright line spectra. This is for four elements. And you're told you have a mixture of two of these. And literally all you're going to do is just play the matching game. A bright line spectrum, uh, spectra for an element is like its fingerprint. So we want to make sure that the lines here for the mixture are all accounted for. And so you literally just kind of go across and you can eliminate. So for example, if we look at element G... There's a double line that appears here, but is not in our mixture. And you have to have all the lines. Can't be element G. Let's go ahead and get rid of that. Now, element E, here we have a line that, again, is not part of our mixture here. Can't be E. Well, if it's going to be a mixture, then it's got to be A and Q. And literally, you can go ahead and play the matching game. You can even use the edge of your reference table to go ahead and line up all the lines and sure enough you're going to find out then the answer is choice one. All right for question 32 you're looking for the mass of an atom. Remember a mass of an atom comes from protons and neutrons not the electrons so 10 plus 9 is 19 and there is our answer choice two for 33 which electron configuration represents electrons of an atom in the excited state. Now all the Electron configurations on the reference table are in the ground state. You can add up the number of electrons, figure out what elements you have on the periodic table. If it's a match, it's ground state. If it's not a match, it's excited state. Excited state means you have one or more, ad, um, I'm sorry, one or more electrons in an atom that are in a higher level than they're supposed to be. And sure enough, what really shows up right away is choice one. 2, 7, and 3, that's element 12, but if you go ahead and you look back at the periodic table, you're going to see it's going to be 2, 8, 2, so the answer is choice 1. Okay, for question 34, you are always going to see a question regarding atomic mass determination. If you watch a separate video I have, in that video I tell you to get mad, that is multiply, add, and divide. You can go ahead and multiply these numbers together, the atomic masses and the natural abundances, then add them together and divide by 100. You're going to get, then you're going to get, rather, the average atomic mass for bromine. You can go ahead then for each of these choices, do the calculations and play the matching game. Or if you recall, right, I need to take my natural abundances out of percent. How do I do that? I divide by 100. And dividing by 100 for each one of, the, uh, one of these means I'm sliding the decimal two spaces to the left. So it's 78.92 times 0.5069 uh, and 80.92 times 0.4931. You're going to add those together. Again, at this point, you play the matching game. Well, again, the 80 goes with the 0.4931, the 78 goes with the 0 0.5069, which is choice three. For question 35, what is the chemical name of co the compound CUS? Well, copper is a transition element. It's either plus one or plus two. How do we figure out what charge was for the metal? Simple. You look up sulfur on the periodic table, you're going to take the top oxidation number because that's the charge sulfur will be when it is bonding with a metal. And sure enough, it's going to be minus two. Since it's one copper for one sulfur, it has to be copper two sulfide. Remember, if it's a binary compound, the ending is IDE. And sure enough, that is choice three. All right, so far, so good. 
let's keep going here in 36 we're given a balanced equation we're asked what's the mass of the n2 produced so this is my x when one gram of h2 completely reacts with 15 grams of no and produces nine grams of h2o well you might have learned how to do stoichiometry problems which is a mass to mass problem this is even easier what we're dealing with here is actually just conservation of mass i'm going to add up both sides and they have to be equal in other words one plus 15 i have a mass of 16 grams and then i have x plus 9 so 16 is equal to x plus 9 which of course is choice 1 which is 7 remember the mass you start with is equal to the mass you end with okay for 37 an atom of which element bonds with an atom of hydrogen to form the most polar bond all right your most polar bond means the highest electronegativity difference since each one of these elements is is bonding with hydrogen what you would want to look up then is the highest electronegativity number for that go to reference table s if you remember fluorine is the most electronegative element we have on the periodic table on a scale of zero to four fluorine is a four and that is our answer doesn't matter though if you forget just go to the reference tables all righty we're looking at question 38 we have a diagram we're talking matter and then it's broken up into the classification well matter consists of elements and compounds and mixtures of elements and or compounds what is representing x what is representing z well examples of x include iron as a solid and calcium carbonate as a solid iron is an element calcium carbonate is a compound these are again pure substances for z air is a mixture and sodium chloride a aqueous meaning salt and water is also a mixture so z is representing mixtures and x is representing substances let's check out the choices here so x again substance and z a mixture and here it is choice two checking out question 39 based on table g which sample when added to 100 grams of water is thoroughly stirred and produces a heterogeneous mixture at 20 degrees Celsius. Okay, heterogeneous mixture means that I'm going to see salt or the solute at the bottom of the 100 grams of water. And 100 grams is important because table G is based on the solubility of different salts at 100 grams. We are looking at a couple of spots here on reference table G. 20 grams of KCl and Ki and 80 grams of KCl and Ki. Let's check it out. Okay, I've marked up table G, 20 degrees Celsius. I put this red line all the way up and then I put an 80 gram, gram blue line and a 20 gram blue line. Ki and KCl. All right, we'll start with the 80. If I'm at 80 grams of Ki, um, unsaturated that is not going to be homogeneous that's going to be I'm sorry that's not going to be heterogeneous that's going to be a homogeneous mixture now for KCl at 20 degrees and 30 grams now all of a sudden I have excess right if I'm at 80 it only holds approximately 30 grams at 20 degrees Celsius so there is going to be 50 grams additional that's going to be sitting at the bottom of the beaker and guess what I think that's our answer but let's keep going here the other mass was at 20 grams at 20 degrees Celsius that's here where these two lines cross both for KCl and Ki that would be an unsaturated situation again which means that the 100 grams of water can hold more of those solutes so the only answer it can possibly be is 80 grams of KCl at 20 degrees Celsius and again notice that I that I went ahead and marked up the solubility curve table. The Regents exam you take, you're only going to have one question on solubility curves. Mark up the table. Make sure you see the answer. It is there. All right, we know now for 39, it's choice three, 80 grams of KCL. 
For 40, how many milliliters of one molar HCl must be diluted with water to make exactly 500 milliliters of 0.1 molar? We are diluting the HCl. Let's go to reference table T to look and see if there's an equation there. All right, we're here at reference table T. Obviously, we're diluting an acid solution. We're just going to go ahead and scroll down. So far, none of the equations work. In fact, there's no word dilution here in this first column. The only thing that's the same format is the titration equation. This is typical of a standardized test where you're given a math um, problem to do and you're not necessarily given every equation. It follows this format, however, right? This for titration is when moles of my acid neutralize moles of my base. For us, the number of moles of the solute are gonna stay the same. All we're doing is we're lowering the molarity by increasing the volume. Let's go back and I'll show you how to go ahead and get the answer. All right, I'm back. Here's the equation. I stole off a reference table T. We have our more concentrated HCl. We have one molar. We want to figure out how much of that we need. On this side, I want to make a 0.1 molar solution, and it's 500 mils. As long as my units for volume are the same on both sides, we're good. All right, so 1 times V is V, and it's 0.1 times 500, which, of course, plug it in your calculator. Your answer is going to be 50. For question 41, which two particle diagrams represent two different phases of the same compound? It cannot be choice A. This is a mixture. I have an element represented by the two open circles, and I have a compound represented by one that's shaded in and one that's open. B, this is a representation of a compound in the gas phase. Look at C. Again, I have a mixture of two gases one that's a diatomic element, and then a compound, and then finally B, I'm sorry, finally D, this would be a compound as a solid because it's its own volume. It's not taking up the volume of the container. In other words, our answer here for 41 is choice 4, B and D. All right, taking a look at question 42, I have a sample dissolved in water to form KCl aqueous, right? This is salty water. This, of course, is a homogeneous mixture. It says when the water in the KCl aqueous is completely evaporated, the sodium chloride remains, the solid remains. Which statement describes a property of KCl solid after the water has evaporated? In other words, what's the property here for potassium chloride? Does potassium chloride become a molecular compound? The answer is no, it is ionic. Does the molar mass of the KCl decrease? The answer is no. Does the melting point stay unchanged? That is my answer. And of course, KCl we know as a solid does not conduct electricity. So the answer for 42 was choice three. For 43, which statement describes ice and liquid water in a stoppered flask, zero degrees Celsius at equilibrium? Well, if I have a stoppered flask, right, here is my liquid, here is my ice, all right? If we're at equilibrium, remember what's equal at equilibrium are the rates. In this case, it's going to be physical changes. If it's a chemical reaction, it's the rate of the forward is equal to the rate of the reverse. Doesn't mean amounts are equal, it's rates. So it can't be three or four. It's got to be either one or two. And let's check it out. So number one, the rate of melting must equal the rate of freezing. Well, that's going to end up being our answer because it has to be equal, equal rates. But um, choice two can't be the answer because one is not greater than the other as far as rates. Again, what's equal in equilibrium are rates. 44, you have a system in equilibrium. You see the double arrows. In the equation, it says when heat is added to the system, what happens to the concentration of N2? When you add heat, that's adding energy. Notice energy is on the left-hand side, so I'm going to just put an up arrow. I'm adding a reactant, which is the energy, 
the shift is going to be towards the products. Now, I didn't add any additional N2 and O2, so these concentrations will decrease. As soon as you know which way the shift is, when, when a teacher says shift, it means the rate of the forward or the reverse reaction now is faster than the opposite. Whatever was shifting away, that's going to drop in concentration. That's your N2 and your O2. And wherever you're pointing, the NO would be going up. Now, we're asked about the concentration of N2. So N2 is decreasing right away, get rid of 3 and 4. And then what's happening to NO, it's increasing. That makes 44 choice 2. All right, for question 45, we have a potential energy diagram. How do I know that? They told me it's a potential energy diagram, and potential energy is on my y-axis, and we're given numbered arrows. That's representing some amount that would be on this y-axis. The question is, which numbered interval represents the activation energy of the reaction? The activation energy is the energy required to get the reaction started, and all substances contain energy. So we're not starting at zero, we're starting here, and we're going to go all the way up here to the, to the top of the potential energy diagram. So our answer here is choice one. For 46, we're given a formula. This is an organic molecule because, of course, carbon's in the molecule, and we're asked what's the chemical name for this compound. Now, it would be just an alkane if it contained just carbons and hydrogens. However, there is a chlorine here. And if you look at the reference tables, let's go do that. We are at reference table R. We're looking at what's known as organic functional groups. These are other elements that end up on organic molecules besides carbons and hydrogens. And here, the first class of compounds, the halides. Sure enough, there's chlorine. When you're going to go ahead and name a halocarbon, you have to put the prefix for the um, halogen along with the number where it is on the carbon on what we call the backbone or the chain of the carbon atoms from left to right or right to left, whatever the lowest number is going to be. In other words, let me show you. All right, so we're back here at 46. We have the one chlorine here. So, and we have one, two, three, four, five. We have five chlorines. So this is going to be a pent, and they're all single bonds. This is a pentane, no carbon-carbon double bonds. I can get rid of then choice one, and I can get rid of choice three. I have the A and E ending. Then the question is, where is the chlorine on this chain or backbone? You count the number of carbons in the chain. I do left to right. I got one, two, three four, five, but I also have to count it from right to left. One, two, three, four, five. According to the rules, whatever number is lower when I count it in both directions, which in this case is two, that is the better answer. That makes this compound 2-chloropentane. Let's look at 47, which formula represents a saturated organic compound. Again, let's go to the reference tables. Now we're looking at reference table Q. We're dealing with hydrocarbons, just hyd hydrogens and carbons in the molecules. We have alkanes, alkenes, alkynes. Our alkanes are saturated. In other words, we don't have any carbon-carbon double or triple bonds. We've maxed out the number of hydrogens on the molecule. And look at this general formula. The number of carbon atoms, in this case for ethane being two, I can put in the number of carbons and then go ahead and take that two for ethane, multiply it by two, which is four, add two, and it would be six. In other words, for ethane, C2H6 would be my formula. I'm looking for something similar in the choices. What you have to do here then is you have to look at each formula and see if it fits the alkane formula of CN is equal to, I'm sorry, the formula of CN is equal to H2N plus 2. So CN H2N plus 2. This first choice can't be the answer 
because it's not CNHN. It can't be choice 2 either because it's not CNH2N. It's H2N plus 2. It can't be choice 3 either because if it's 3 carbons, then it would be 2 times 3 plus 2 or 8 hydrogens. And it has to be choice 4. And in, that is my answer, C3H8. In other words, if N is equal to 3, then 3 times 2 is 6 plus 2 is 8. That's our answer. All right, let's take a look at 48. We have two different compounds here. These are known as condensed structural formulas. And we're asked what's different about them. All right, are the number of carbon atoms different? And if we take a look, I have three carbons here for this. I have three for this. That's not the answer. The next one is the number of hydrogens. I have three plus two plus three. I have eight hydrogens here, and I have eight hydrogens here. That's not the answer. It is not the molecular masses. They would actually be the same. It's just the atoms arranged differently. It has to be functional groups. This first molecule here with the OH is an alcohol, and here I have carbon and oxygen in the a linkage, and that is an ether. If you're not sure about functional groups, then you're going to head over to the reference tables and take a look at uh, reference table R. Here's our alcohols, there's the OH, and our ethers. Again, the O is part of the chain. For question 49, we're looking at a voltaic cell. This is spontaneous. The wire connects the electrodes, the salt bridge connects the ions, and we're asked about the direction of flow. Now, it always goes from anode to cathode. Now, anox, red cat. The anode is where oxidation is taking place and the losing of electrons, and the cathode is where we have the gaining of electrons taking place. If I look at the overall equation, I have magnesium atoms becoming magnesium ions. Why? Because we have the loss of electrons. So the magnesium is my anode, and my nickel then is my cathode. So the flow here is from the magnesium solid through the wire to the nickel solid, or choice two. Question 50 is an acid-base question, and we're asked about which pair are hydrogen ion donors. This is part of Bronsted-Lowry th theory, when, where an acid is a proton or H plus donor, and a base is an acceptor. Before you go to the choices, label your equation. You have ammonia and H3, and its pairing on the other side is NH4 plus. Take a look, ammonia gained H plus. We're looking for the H plus donors. We're pairing water with hydroxide. In other words, water gave up an H plus to NH3. So that is our acid here on the left. On the other side, going in reverse, it's the NH4 plus as the acid giving up the H plus to the OH minus. So our pair is H2O and NH4 plus, which is choice three. Well, that's the last of the B-1 questions. Check out some more videos. I'll be doing the B-2 and part C. Don't skip those questions. They are short answer questions. They can be challenging. You want to do all the kinds of questions that might be thrown at you when you take your Regents exam. And as always, good luck.